So hello, everybody. Um, happy Thursday. Um, I'm really excited to share virtual space with you all. Um, on, behalf of the, uh, on behalf of my colleagues here at AIDS United, I would like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar titled Nothing About Us Without Us, Recentering Sex Work and Harm Reduction. For folks who don't know who I am, um, my name is Mark Lockwood, and I'm a program manager on the harm reduction team here at AIDS United. Um, I've been in harm reduction now for about seven years and draw on a background of lived experience, um, training and capacity building, direct services, and program management, um, focused primarily on the health and safety of people who use drugs, people who are in the sex trades, including survivors of trafficking. Um, today is a very important day, um, International Sex Workers Day, and it's really um, a day to um, mark the 1975 occupation um, of St. Nazir Church by 100 sex workers um, who were protesting their criminalized and exploited living conditions. Today, um, we're really um, highlighting International Sex Workers Day to create awareness about the issues faced by sex workers and to protect their human rights. Next slide, please. So um, this slide here is primarily for folks who aren't um, aware of AIDS United as an organization. We were first conceived through um, our policy and advocacy work and was born out of a early coalition in the early days of HIV. This was in 1984, um, and we were originally called the AIDS Action Council in partnership with other AIDS service organizations. Since then, AIDS United has been one of the nation's leading organizations with efforts to end the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, AIDS United's mission is to end the AIDS epidemic in the US, and we seek to fulfill this mission through strategic partnerships, through capacity building, through policy and advocacy, technical assistance, and formative research. So just a, a little bit of level setting here. Um, I really want us to get our juices flowing on today's panel um, and really you know, sort of think through this collectively as our panelists are in conversation with one another. And today's essential question is, how can we as service providers, as community organizers, as community members, as state bureaucrats on this call, as scholars and researchers, as practitioners, um, as public health leaders, and even as family and friends work collectively and intentionally to mobilize the health, safety, and well being of people in the sex trades? Um, and also, why is this even important? So as controversial as it sounds, I really always, uh, when I'm doing trainings, I always say this, that there certainly cannot be an AIDS-free generation without efforts to decriminalize sex work. Again, there certainly cannot be an AIDS-free generation without efforts to decriminalize sex work. So the UN, in fact, the United Nations reported on the impact of bad laws in the worldwide response to HIV and found that in order to ensure an effective, sustainable response to HIV that is consistent with human rights obligations, that all countries must repeal all punitive laws on sex work, given that criminalization and collusion with social stigma makes sex workers' lives more unstable, less safe, and far riskier in terms of HIV. And we know that sex worker criminalization can include a many of things, right? Um, when I worked in direct services, it, uh, many of my participants were criminalized primarily for having condoms, um, for jailing people um, on solicitation or even walking while appearing to be engaged in sex work. Um, folks in harm reduction, we know this as the walking while trans bill. And even um, now, more recently, we see the criminalization of sex work primarily through FOSTA SESTA, which was a federal law that penalized um, sites like Craigslist and Backpage simply for advertising sex work, right? And so, really thinking about sex work in the context of a legal, so, uh, sort of social political framework, right? We understand that criminalization makes sex workers. Um, it places sex workers further into precarity, right? And this is largely due to the fear of arrest um, from law enforcement. Um, many sex workers also have bared witness to police destroying or confiscating and using condoms um, as physical, physical evidence to actually do um, their arrest. And so what does this all mean, right? I always say that it's important for us to work collaboratively, right? Namely because these conversations around sex work and decriminalization, as well as sort of harm reduction practices often are happening in silo. 
And so really a service organization should work alongside harm reduction organizations. Harm reduction organizations must work alongside community-based organizations, all as touch points that work primarily with people who participate in the sex trade. And so what I really hope today is that this webinar sort of acts as a call and response, right? And really addressing one, not only the impacts of SESTA-FOSTA and other harmful policies, but also really working collectively to um, sort of understand how harm reduction programs can create sex worker-centered harm reduction services, as well as how harm reduction, I mean, as well as how sex worker health in particular can be prioritized across the country. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of ground rules, right? So bear in mind that today's webinar is being recorded. So be sure if you can to mute your line while the webinar is going on to prevent distractions. Um, and once the Q&A starts, we'll invite audience members to either unmute themselves or ask in the chat, however you feel comfortable, right? And in the interim, if you do have questions as the panel's going on, I really encourage folks to use the question and answer option down below um, on Zoom. And those questions will be addressed during our Q&A session. Next slide. And then lastly, I would be remiss, of course, if I did not introduce um, our amazing panelists. Again, I'm so excited to be in community with everyone um, listed here. And all of our uh, panelists in particular draw on a background of not only lived experience, but direct involvement in um, harm reduction and sex worker rights spaces. So the first uh, panelist that we have is Tamika Spellman. Um, Tamika began advocating in the early 1990s as a mouthy homeless transgender woman pushing for positive poly policy change for trans women in shelters in Washington, DC. She continued advocacy work in 2007 with Jefferson County's AIDS and minorities in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama as a spokesperson for the I Am the Face of HIV campaign then finally started working in HIPS in June 2017 after first becoming a client. She started by volunteering with mobile services, then moved on to be a peer educator while working with the secondary ex syringe exchange program. In 2018, Tamika was promoted to become the policy and advocate associate. And in 2021, she became the policy and community engagement manager for the HIPS advocacy department. She is dedicated to promoting policies and laws that help those engaging in sex work and drug use. She's testified numerous times on behalf of HIPS at DC council hearings, spoke on several harm reduction panels, and is managing the SWAC court, is, the man, is managing the Sex Worker Advocacy Coalition, we know it as SWAC, or now as Decrim Now, and a community organizer for the Decrim Poverty Movement. She also served as an advisor to the Sex Worker Given Circle, the Chosen Few, and No Justice, No Pride. She is a member of the Urban Survivors Union and held a seat as a board member for the Church of Safe Injection in Maine. She also has a few op-eds in The Root, several on Medium, and appear in several articles and, as, and is the recipient of an award from the Legal Society of Washington, D.C. She also was instrumental in the passage of a bill in Washington, D.C. to decriminalize drug paraphernalia and has become a featured speaker on within the harm reduction arena. She has also advised congressional representatives Ayanna Presley, um, Ro Khanna, on proposed legislation and continues to consult members of Congress throughout their legislative drafting process. Thank you so much, Tamika. The next uh, panelist we have um, is Jane Tyler. Um, Jane is currently the Director of Operations of Baltimore Safe Haven and CEO of Jane Darling LLC, a LGBT advocacy and sexual health consultation firm. She is a 34-year-old trans woman of color, and at the tender age of 15 years old, Jane lost her mother to what she later found was due to complications of HIV. Determined to turn her tragedy into triumph, Jane set out to educate herself on HIV. In 2010, Jane landed her first job in HIV prevention as an HIV test counselor. In 2013, she began her work in advocacy from marching on the front lines to a commissioner on Philadelphia's Commission on LGBT Affairs to multi-board appointees. Jane provide, I mean, prides herself on being an award-winning HIV and public health champion 
LGBT activist, victim advocate, and a leader in both the mainstream and Kiki ballroom scene. Thank you, um, Jonay, for also being here as well. Um, our next panelist is Soma Snake Oil. Um, Soma is the executive director of the Side Rock Project, a lived experience harm reduction organization that works with unhoused people with a priority for people who use drugs and street-based sex workers. Soma's passion for the houseless community comes from lived experience as a long-term former drug user, being unhoused in almost 18 years of sex work, including survival sex. And then last but not least, um, we have Katie Evans um, here. Katie Evans is the manager and director of Spark Baltimore, which is affiliated with Johns Hopkins University. Um, Katie has been working to improve community health outcomes in Baltimore for the past nine years, with five of those licensed years as a social worker. Katie joined Spark's team in 2019 and has since then managed a mobile, de mobile delivery service program, started a volunteer program, and spearheaded the Spark team in growing from an average of 250 in outreach encounters per month to over 100 outreach encounters per month within the South and Southwest Baltimore communities. Prior to her work with Spark, Katie served as a mental health clinician specializing in servicing people who experience homelessness and those seeking treatment for substance abuse. Katie is a proud Baltimore native and can frequently be found on going on runs throughout the city street. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much. Um, and then last, of course, I'm going to read a little bit about our moderator, Jessica Martinez. Um, Jessica Martinez is a harm reductionist who specializes in urban, suburban, and rural stimulus use. Jessica studied at George Washington University, where she received her Bachelor of Arts with a major in American Studies. And her focus in American Studies included healthcare inequities, racism, criminalization, as well as the war on drugs. Jessica began, her pro began a program in Washington, D.C. to assist those in chemsex known as the Methamphetamine Services Program at HIPS. Jessica created a network of peer, exchange, ex peer exchangers and educators who would go out into the community to specifically uh, target polysubstance use and stim stimulant use. Um, I can honestly say I've worked with Jessica, um, and Jessica is currently the program manager um, here at AIDS United and really excited to um, have her moderate this panel. So now I'm gonna throw it over to Jessica um, to take us into conversation. Thank you all so much. And I hope that y'all enjoy today's discussion. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Mark. Oh, geez. To be around so many amazing titans of sex work advocacy, harm reduction. I truly am happy to be here with you all today. Um, I have a first question that can go to anyone, and um, in recognizing today's International Sex Workers Day, we want to highlight the important historical struggle people have had to engage with their work safely. How do days like today increase visibility on the battle for sex workers' rights, and why is it important to highlight sex workers across the world? I guess I'll start. <laughs> I feel like, you know, sex workers being out and about are putting us on the forefront of letting people know that we're just like normal everyday people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm your neighbor next door. You just don't know what I do for a living. You know, um, I feel like days like today are important because we as a country have a long and illustrious history with sex work, even in the District of Columbia. There were quite a few brothels just west of the White House in a neighborhood called Logan Circle. And it is now one of those gentrified neighborhoods that are having million dollar properties selling on a, on a regular and then people are finding out there are sex workers working in their neighborhood. But real talk, they were there before you were. <laughs> They've always been there, you know. It never really changed as the city changed and grew. You know, sex work just continued on and it's, it's continual. You know, so it's like we're part of the fabric of the city. 
you know, and why shouldn't we be acknowledged? Yeah, piggybacking off of Tamika, the other aspect is not just your neighbors not knowing what you're doing, but also the people in your personal life, like friends and family, having to keep those identities separate. So having days like International Sex Worker Days or days to recognize sex workers on a larger level also helps sex workers connect with each other in a job that can feel so isolating sometimes. I'm going to bounce on this one too. I really appreciate what Tamika and Katie are saying. It, it, one of the things that I love that Tamika said was that we're part of the fabric of the community. And I think really putting this in a historical context is really vital. You know, 1975, that was the year I was born. 1975 was when, you know, these sex workers in France were fighting for the same thing we're fighting for today, for rights and for liberation, for understanding of violence and police violence and, you know, inhumane working conditions. So this is, this is a fight that's been going on for a very long time. I mean, we, we even think about like the suffragettes who did so much for the women's movement were also incredibly racist and incredibly, um, you know, damaging to sex workers. And, and part of criminalization was because of the suffragettes. So I think it's really important for us to think in historical terms so that we can learn for the future. Awesome, thank you all. Um, and yes, I really do appreciate that, Tamika. We all are part of this project, whether we have lived experience or not, um, checking in on folks, especially when they're working, checking in on sex workers, not only on today is super important. So thank you for that. My second question is, how are sex work and harm reduction related to one another? And I have a follow-up for that one. Um, I guess I'll go. <laughs> uh, in terms of sex work and harm reduction, right, um, when we think about it, especially from, like, the standpoint of, like, an ASO, um, you, you want to make sure that you are um, providing services, right, that minimizes and mitigates risk for sex workers, right? So that doesn't, that, that starts by looking at the holistic point of view. Um, and that's just not them engaging in sex work, right? But that's also them, uh, what they're doing um, to get ready for sex work. Um, and coming from someone who is a former sex worker, right? This is not something that you did sober. So whatever your drug of choice was, right? Making sure that we're able to, you know, provide you those green, those, those clean tools and, and new ones, right? To be able to push you forward and they, so that you can engage you know, um, safely, and not just the sex work point of, but also uh, the the startup of it, which is you getting ready to go out there in the in the world and prepare yourself for the sex work, which is the drug use, um, and so that's that's how the two is related together, and and I think that in order for us to move forward, we need to um, start addressing not just one portion of that, but both. Actually, Janae, my second question, um, part of the question was, what ways do you think coalition can be forged between harm reductionists and sex workers? And you were about to start, so if you'd like to continue, I'd love to hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so um, I think a coalition, right, when I think, I think a lot of times, especially when we talk about from um, I'm going to digress really quickly. When we talk about this work, um, oftentimes we work in silos, right? It's like this agency will only work with their own agency or this agency will only work with select agencies. And oftentimes what we're doing is we're doing a disservice to the community because we, um, we may not be able to offer um, complete services that one needs, right? So what we need to do is start being able to kind of bridge those gaps and, and start working together in unison with other agencies to be able to say, you know, hey, I can do this portion of it and you can do this. Now let's think about how we can better serve this community and then start to usher and move forward in that way and not just you and one other agency, right? But all of those agencies that does that same work and that same mind frame, right? Because 
my, the community that I reach may not be the community that they reach, right? And we all specialize in our own communities. And that's what makes each agency unique and special. We all have our own um, outlook and our own approaches to the community members that we all meet, right? So if we can band together as ASOs, CBOs, um, harm reduction centers, and uh, build a coalition where you can service your clients, right? But we're also um, giving each other technical assistance and resources and, and, and um, talking about what that looks like. You know, how do we get to your community? What is it that we need to know that can make us more culturally competent, right? Like those type of things. Um, and I think once we be able to get to those places and have those conversations, we can begin to bend, bend forward, bend together and move forward in a way that is not counterproductive to the community that we are trying to serve. I really love that. Like thinking about the complex intersections that different people face, like people aren't just one identity, right? They have multiple different facets of themselves and those can intersect or not intersect. So it's kind of like the job of ASOs and harm reduction organizations, right? To be like handing out condoms, to be doing um, safer sex education because you can't have one without the other, right? Absolutely. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to add so much? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak on this a little bit. It, it was interesting that you're talking about um, how sex work and harm reduction relate to each other. And I think it's so, it's important to make a distinction between sex work and sex work activism and organizing. So harm reduction is such a useful tool, as we know, for sex workers around public health and, like you mentioned, condoms and, and you know sexual education. But then there's also how it relates to activism and the fight for liberation. And I think this is really important because at the core, harm reduction is a social justice movement. And we have to remember that it is a social justice movement for the rights, dignity, and liberation of people who use drugs and sex workers. And, you know, and I, I think, you know, thinking in that way, it, it, it can be very dangerous sometimes if we look at the harms for sex work and, we can sometimes tend to blame people for their behavior or for what happens to them. And it is so vital for us to look on a larger scale of what are the biggest harms. The biggest harms are social, they're systemic, and this is part of what makes the job so dangerous. I agree, but to that point, um, I would also say too, a part of uh, providing services, right, is making sure that we tailor our services to each client, right? Because each client is in a one size fit all, right? So you may have a client who uh, may have more pressing needs, right? And more pressing harm reduction issues um, and, and sex work may not be a concern for them, right? Or, or how they're going about sex work may not be a concern for them or the vice versa, uh, the harm reduction may be the key component for them and not the sex work. Um, so I think what, what we uh, what we should you know um, oftentimes we have like this cookie cutter approach, and sometimes we got to remove that cookie cutter approach and realize that we have to tailor that specifically to each individualized person. And I think like what you're saying, Janae, is like being intentional. You know what I mean? Like not just doing harm reduction, like being like, oh, we'll get you these vaccines, we'll get you this STI treatment, like advocating for better policies, like working to reduce the harm from the state. I love that. I really do. Um, and I think that's a great recommendation for everyone watching. Um, my next question, unless anyone has something they wanted to add, I feel like we touched on everything. I did want to say a little bit about the coalition, coalition work. Um, I, I, I tend to be in different coalitions across the board because I intersect on so many different things and, and you know, the client base that we have at HIPS, there are a lot of concerns and issues that the people come to me with. So when I find a coalition that's working or if I can create one, I always try to go into my coalition meetings and figure it out. 
how can this coalition benefit the other one? You know, and I try to cross pollinate coalitional work to it, it's it builds power. The more people you bring into the the movement, the more power you bring to that movement. You know, and the more change that you can affect. You know, I I love going big on my ass. I like to ask for a lot because I know how they work. They're going to cut you back. They're going to cut back on whatever the ask is. So go big. Just like they do with those big federal government pork barrel kind of budgetary ass. Do the same thing when you come with an ass. Come at them with so much that they look at it and they be like, okay, we can't do this. We can cut out that. Because it doesn't matter if you come in with the bare minimum, the real ass that you really have. You know, I go at least 70% above. And this is where I get it from is these coalitional relationships that I have. I bring that power and that element into each room that I'm in to build more power so that we get what we are going for. Tamika, I love that. And I may just steal that. <laughs> Also great advice. Always very shoot effective. for the stars. I think <laughs> it's there, very a sign, um, You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> so um, that is awesome. Thank you, Tamika. And yeah, always shoot big, y'all, for funding. Um, the next question actually has to do with um, financials. So since Sesta Fosta, how has sex work changed over time? And how... Can these changes impact the sex workers trying to make ends meet? Ooh, baby, can I start? <laughs> yes, you may. It to me has been like a split. There has been like a split. Those that could afford to continue on doing online sex work were able to move upstream because there's a barrier to moving upstream that a lot of the lower level sex workers that were in the online avenues have had to revert to doing street-based sex work, you know? So it's been like, just either, it's e either or. If you were have, have the capacity and the ability to, to access these, uh, these new web, web avenues, I mean, I have the access, but I'm not technolog technologically smart enough to do this Bitcoin thing. You know, because it, like the barrier for me was being able to have a bank based credit card. Now, that it, that additional barrier of doing Bitcoin, that's out of my league. I'm not fucking with that. I don't know anything about it. Excuse my language. I do curse. I'm grown. I hope the rest of you in this room are too. We curse. But my point is, is that, you know, those that had the capacity and the ability to move upstream could move upstream and it's not cheap. It is not cheap. It is not like it used to be where there was greater access. Now, the girls that could not access it have returned to street-based sex work and have put themselves at more risk. You know, they don't have the ability to be able to, comp to, to, to negotiate for safer sex as much as you could if you were working online. You know, that was the greatest thing that ever happened was when I found out about that and I did not want to go back to street-based sex work. You know, and, and, and a lot of us were faced with a choice, you know, especially for like transgender women. You know, a lot of us cannot get regular jobs, no matter how hard we have tried, and then there are not enough nonprofits to hire us. And we shouldn't be looking for that to be the solution. What we should be doing is working on the barriers that keep us from having a regular job. You know what I'm saying? Instead of them coming in with these arbitrary ass laws that have absolutely no effect. This law that came into law has not been used, but they have been doing quite a few prostitution things that they are now calling anti-trafficking stings. It's the same thing. And it's still yeah. ineffective. We are going to get into that whole trafficking topic because I think it's super important. Thank you so, so much, Shamika, for giving like your
personal, but also what you've seen on the ground um, regarding SESTA FOSTA. Katie, I'm wondering, since you work at Spark, what have you seen on the ground, you know, since SESTA FOSTA has happened? Yeah, so uh, for larger context, um, Spark does a lot of outreach work in South and Southwest Baltimore, and most of our work is with people who are engaged in street-based sex work. But we've seen, similar to what Tamika is describing, folks who are able to do um, more online sex work were able to operate out of hotels. Um, and so that allows for more stability. And then when you both can't put yourself online or can't connect MasterCard or can't promote your services through Instagram or Twitter or other things or other platforms because platforms are doing more censorship to try to remove their own liability to be connected to sex work, then those folks who we're seeing who are more stably housed in hotels are now back doing street-based sex work. Um, and that wasn't a personal choice. That was a choice that was taken from them by this legislation. Um, and it also like that houselessness piece just then like perpetuates so many other problems. So then it's not just, I don't have access to the same dates that I had before, but I also need to figure out where I'm going to sleep tonight. I need to make sure where I sleep, I'm not going to get robbed and I'm going to wake up with my stuff. Um, and I don't get into a fight with the person who runs that house or wherever I'm staying, or I have to pay money to that person, or like you just, you lose so much of your own independence whenever you don't have a place to stay. Um, and all of that can be taken so quickly whenever you're surviving date to date and staying in a place like a hotel or something like that. Um, so I think SESTA FOSTA impacted a smaller percentage of uh, Sparks population than maybe other places, but we still see the impact of other types of legislation like um, local bills about um, uh, what is the word? loitering and walking while trans black, et cetera, like just all of those kind of led pieces of legislation tend to impact folks in Baltimore, I think a little bit more than maybe SESTA FOSTA has, at least for people in street-based sex work, but all of it is so damaging so quickly as soon as it's enacted. So yeah. I'll say, I know for me, um, I remember when uh, this kind of like first round kind of happened back in the day when it was like um, Craigslist and Backpage and all of those things. And I was, I was um, in between jobs and was heavily reliant on, um, you know, on sex work. Um, and like, I had no idea that any of these things coming into play. And I remember being on the road and like, um, I actually like having me in money for a couple of days and like was coming up due in my hotel room and like then all of a sudden sites just went down. <laughs> like and I had no idea what was going on and was like in such a panic um that I just like I had no idea what to do. Um but for me, right, it's like what I something that I can't get out of my mind is why are we so consumed with policing what folks do with their bodies, right? Like sex work is work, baby. And if you've never did sex work, honey, it's probably some of the hardest work you've ever freaking do. Um, but sex work is work. But why are we so compelled? on worrying about what folks do with their bodies when we have so many other essential things that we must worry about as a country, right? And it's just like, this is what y'all choose to spend our tax dollars worrying about. Not and then poverty, right? Not, you know, providing workforce development, like all these things, right? So you take a resource away from folks right to to enable them to uh be able to live but you don't replace it with something else that can continue to sustain them so you take sex work away from them but where's the empowerment right where is the workforce development where is you know the uh the free universities and all these things that we can really afford as a country if we stop pouring in so much countless dumbness right like that's my thing and that's that's one of the big things that i always had and just going back like to my experience there like that was one of the most terrifying experiences 
that like I ever had. And I think after that, like even though I did continue sex work here and there, like after that, it was just like that was one of the most scariest experiences for me. And I realized like I can't rely on like internet based sites in order for me to do it. But then it's like, how do I do it, right? Because I'm not, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a punk. So I'm not going out on the street and walking around. So it's like, I had to figure out what what I had to do to, you know, to figure out, like, you know, to make my ends meet. And it was just like, you know, I had just got laid off my job, right? And I'm like trying to do the best that I can. And it was just like, listen, I mean, you know, so like it, it it's frustrating. Like we have so many more things that we can worry about um besides what folks do to make a living it's not like we're out here trafficking it's not like we're out here robbing folks right um oftentimes sex workers are the victims of of crimes and not sex workers being the assailants right like so it's like where why what is so um like, what is the major push to stop us from being able to make our money? Especially when the ones that's making the laws is normally the ones that's calling this. But I'm going to digress. <laughs> Can I yeah. just briefly echo everything that everyone is saying? I, I'm just hearing everyone speak so much truth on this. I think, you know, SESTA-FOSTA is violent policy that has pushed people deeper into poverty and then the circumstances of poverty are just crushing people. Like um, one of our participants is a young trans woman who specifically cites SESTA-FOSTA as having pushed her back out onto the street where she was formerly able to manage her business online. You know, she was evicted as a result of not being able to advertise and while working on the street, she was then raped and got HIV. So when I think of SESTA-FOSTA, I just think of SESTA-FOSTA as incredibly violent in such a real way where it's actually affecting people's lives, public health, you know, people have died as a result of it. Um, I was just speaking with a friend of mine last night who's an educator and she can't post all of her education materials anymore to, to, to work and teach about sex and BDSM and all of those things. And so as a result, she's being pushed back into doing sex work that she didn't want to do. So yeah, it's just catastrophic. I think we really have to continue to, to push to have it repealed. A lot of the laws in this country are very violent. You know, a lot of the policies that are being pushed are violent. You know, them trying to take Roe versus Wade away is violent. That's violent to women. Stay out of our uh, our collective wounds. Stay out of the out of the army. If you don't have one, stop trying to monitor somebody that does have one. Men have no business telling a woman what to do with their body. You know, and I have no business telling nobody else what to do with theirs. You know, I think football is violent, but they still play football. They use their bodies how they want to. As long as they have an owner over them, I guess it's okay. You know, hockey is violent. Violent as hell. You know, but then we need to really go back in history in this country and think about pre-prohibition, before we got freedom in this country. My skin folks, I'm talking about. We were on sex farms where they would come to have sex with us. And so long as it was a white woman or a white man that was getting the money and profiting off of our black asses, it was okay. But as soon as emancipation came, shit changed. And they started changing laws and they figured out more and more ways to take those slave capturers and turned them into police to police my black ass. And one of those ways to police my black ass was to take away the ability of white men to continue to have sex with black women and pay for that black ass that they just had to a black person. I'm not stupid and I know how the laws have been happening across this country. I'm, I'm the oldest head in this world. 
You know, I remember saying something about 1975. I remember that. I was a 10-year-old. Okay, so I remember about those things about the sex workers in, in France. I heard, I was little. I pay attention to shit like that. I've always been into politics. And I've also seen how they have criminalized HIV. You can see it in all the policies that they've created. You know, the war on drugs is, 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 is a very violent policy, how it decimated Black communities. You know, <laughs> don't get me started on that. I'm going to turn this back over to Jessica for the next question. I'm sorry, Tamika. I, like, I know we could go on about that all day because we used to talk about that all the time, which is why I popped that in the chat right there. If you want to Google that, that's a real fact. Um, number four, MasterCard recently has put restrictions in place that further restricts the ability for sex workers to make a living. What recommendations would you make to address the growing crisis within online sex work? I know some, we had touched on this a little bit discussing SESTA FOSTA, but the MasterCard issue is obviously a totally different issue. People have been losing clients. I believe I saw a Vice article saying that 70% of online sex workers lost some form of income due to the MasterCard issue. So um, yeah, whoever wants to go first. Okay, I'm my oldest here, so I'm gonna go first. Tell <laughs> me this is gonna be real quick. Okay, so I'm I'm an older sex worker. I've been doing this for four decades. Okay, and I'm 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 getting at that point where I want to try to do some other things. And I opened up my OnlyFans, and as soon as I opened it, this is when this stuff started with with Mastercard, and then it started to pervade other industries where they're putting a lot of different requirements on the content that you're posting. You know, you can't use MasterCard to receive any of the money from those things now. They, they, they're not playing that now. And they're putting pressure on other uh, uh, cardholders to do the same thing. Stay out of my business. You know what I'm saying? Come on now, what kind of company country is this that we're allowing a con company to segregate and segment people who are already marginalized. This is supposed to be the melting pot of the world. This is what I grew up with learning, that this was a melting pot and everything that I have seen that this country has been undertaking has proven it wrong. We're putting up a wall down there in Mexico when we celebrated the wall coming down in Germany. You know, what, what kind of message are we sending as a country when we're letting Business entities take and, and say that they're a person to have a vote and then take that vote and use it against me, against the whole industry of people because they don't like what we're doing personally. Well, you know what? I don't like a lot of things that people do personally, but so long as you're doing whatever you do safely, do you. And they're making my life hard. My life got real hard at that point, you know, and I'm trying to transition away from a traditional job back to working for myself, solely for myself. And that was part of my exit plan. Thanks for taking my exit plan away from me. Anyone else want to speak on the MasterCard issue, Soma? Yeah, I'll, just briefly, I think we have to think about MasterCard specifically, but then also in broader terms around the fact that um, sex worker money is stolen from us in this process. I mean, we've seen it with PayPal. I experienced that personally where they shut down my account and kept all of the money in the account because I was selling adult content. And what happens, you know, and there's there's a lot of different implications with, with this financially. We've seen about um, the potential to, um, criminalized or to go after people because of their bank accounts or, or what they're receiving in their bank accounts. And again, it's stealing sim very similar to what has happened with the war on drugs as well when people's um, resources are confiscated. And what this does is it pushes us out of society. It makes it so we can't pay rent. We can't, you know, pay any of our bills because, um, you know, we don't have the same financial access. It turns us into pariahs. 
and makes it, um, you know, it's, it's another form of violence that just makes it impossible to survive. Someone asked in the chat really quick, what prompted MasterCard? I'm just gonna answer that really quick. And Katie, I saw you wanted to speak. Um, so you're right after me. So what happened is um, financial institutions, right? They wanna know where the money's coming in, right? Because they have a responsibility to ensure that money and report it to the government, right? Every bank financial institution has to have a ledger of what sort of finances they have. The issue is, is that MasterCard believes that due to online sex work, some of these people may be underage, may be um, trafficked, may be doing it against their will, or may be coerced because um, they believe that online sex workers could be trafficked or online sex work is um, in a way almost like criminal. You know, like it's the, the act of doing sex work online. It's almost the same as doing sex work in person as they see it. So they don't want to be associated with dirty money. Does that make sense? They currently are working with certain like actors. So like one of the things that they did was like, if you do kink stuff, you have to like, you can't do bondage stuff. You can't hit people, hitting, slapping. They put kind of like recommendations and restrictions because they're also trying to restrict what kind of content people purchase with MasterCard to, I don't know, reduce harm. That was their argument. So now you wanna also um, police how I spend my money. <laughs> Right, it goes both ways too. Janae's actually bringing up a great point because a lot of people stopped purchasing online sex work pornography or imagery because they were afraid of MasterCard giving them issues. So actually the consumer itself has been impacted too. So yeah. So I just wanna say like, so what happened to this like land of the free thing that we're supposed to be um because it seems like to me but all this goes back to what uh tamika said it and i believe someone else said it i'm sorry forgetting but like all this comes from if we were if we were still like on these you know sex farms and like the fact that we were able to take the power back right and and start you know getting paid ourselves for our own bodies right this is where the criminalization comes from this is just really another way to like pull us back right like another way like oh they're starting to know like their worth right they're starting to not have to really rely on us and and so it's like now they want to put all these laws in place that stops us again now, right, from getting to a point where we just got to, where we're able to be sustainable in the sex trade, right? And, and which is exactly what they did to us back in the day. But because now we're taking it back, they want to kind of put all these restrictions on it. But, I mean, they, they had no problem doing it. So, it, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, I saw Katie, you wanted to say something. I want to make sure you get space. Uh, so I can speak less to the MasterCard piece, but when Soma was describing what was happening with PayPal and other online payment methods, like stealing money from people engaged in sex work or sex education, um, to describe what that looks like for folks engaged in street-based sex work, at least in Baltimore, one of the most common practices prior to the changes in the last year or so with semi-decriminalizing sex work in Baltimore was to have police officers pick up folks who were on the stroll, accept a date, accept services, and then when it was time for payment, arrest those folks. Um, and at the height of it, I mean, some small neighborhoods that we were in, and when I say small, I mean like three streets wide and like maybe like six or seven blocks long would have up to like eight to 10 police officers at one point, like in one week, just coming through looking for dates, but then really just robbing people. So I just wanted to add that that doesn't just happen to people engaged in online sex works in these more formal platforms, but also that like individual 
police officers are also asserting this kind of violence by robbing sex workers who are on the stroll at night or during the day too. Um, so it's at like every, every level there are predators and people just in positions of power stealing money from folks engaged in sex work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That is such an important point. And just from my personal lived experience, cops were always the worst. Um, number five, um, and I want to also note that we um, were supposed to start in about like five minutes Q&A, but I'm going to go through the questions a little quickly and we're going to start Q&A at the 45 mark. Okay. Um, so OnlyFans put out a ban which led to sex workers losing customers whether due to lack of confidence in the platform or because of fears of being targeted from a ban. OnlyFans eventually walked back the ban, but it still left scars on sex workers' wallets. How can sex workers and harm reduction organizations advocate for policies, regulations, and for sex workers themselves? And if we want to also just touch upon OnlyFans, we've kind of like talked about it quite a bit, but I mean, this is more specifically about the um, banning and like shadow banning of POC trans folks. So like if anyone wants to start and speak on that. Yeah, I kind of got caught up in that when it first started and I'm just now being able to post content again because they were suddenly wanting me to give them release forms for everyone that I work with, which a lot of my clients wanted to remain anonymous and not have anything to do with it. They agreed to be video. You know, I don't video anyone without their consent, but they were asking for model release forms, which they didn't want any part of. And then they took down all of my content, just took my content down. And a lot of this content, once I posted it, I had the phone I had, I didn't have space, so I deleted. And I didn't back it up in my cloud account. You know, I, I think that the setting was set and it would be there, but it's not. You know, so I've lost valuable content when I was launching my OnlyFans. This all happened around all that time when I launched my OnlyFans and I've lost the momentum and the will to get back at it. You know, it kind of discouraged. And, and, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, why did y'all move the bar? What made you move the bar? Is it this thing with this, with MasterCard? Because it happened around the same time. You know, and I felt like it was just really kind of like, Am I being singled out as a trans woman because I'm not doing what typical trans women do? I'm, I'm a dominatrix. That's a niche market. You know, and, and, and <laughs> I guess they weren't accepting of what I was doing to these people. You know, I mean, I felt like I was singled out amongst a bunch of, of, of other people and I didn't know how at, at first to, to, to advocate for myself on this. As an advocate, it was hard to think on how do I do this when I have like 15 other things I have to do, you know? So being a part of national organizational unions was where I, I was able to dial in and to get my say and, and, and to talk about how we could collectively as sex workers push back. Because that's real messed up. You know, I'm a marginalized person. I'm a marginalized 50 something year old transgender woman that have been through a lot of shit in my life. And for them to keep, the, to take away what was supposed to be another income as a safety blanket for me is real messed up. Yeah, thank you so much, Tamika. Like that is, thank you for sharing that so genuinely and honestly, because it is true. There is this um, stigma existing on online sex work now that's resulting in people being shadow banned for being black, 
um, you know, POC maybe, sure, but like mostly Black folks, um, big and beautiful is being targeted, you know, so people are being singled out. And um, I'm wondering how should harm reduction organizations and sex worker rights advocates incorporate a pro LGBT anti-racist body positive framework into their harm reduction and sex work advocacy? Um, Katie, I don't know if that's what you were going to speak on. I'm sorry, I did. I just noticed right. that you were muted. No, that's okay. So I, I was hoping to speak on the, the aspect of how to harm reduction organizations, kind of how can they support sex worker rights and those movements and kind of what some of those difficulties can be. And I see it on two levels, like both on the individual level when you're providing services to folks. Um, if you're a harm reduction organization, there's a good chance that you are supposed to be collecting data and reporting on that data. And if you're working with folks who are engaged in sex work, that is something that can be really difficult and also just create an unnecessary barrier for people to access services, for people to identify themselves. Even to identify as a sex worker can be a really difficult, messy thing. There's a lot of people who engage in a lot of different types of work that kind of feel related to sex work, but people might not actually identify that way. So that, that aspect of trying to collect information from people can prevent sex workers from accessing harm reduction programs. Um, and then the other aspect of the operation of harm reduction programs is that so much of the funding opportunities tends to be towards direct service, which is great, but also it doesn't leave a lot of capacity for advocacy. So we have all these outcomes that we have to meet in terms of like how many tests we're going to provide and how many um, like risk reduction counseling sessions we're going to do. And by the end of the week, you're at Thursday afternoon and like there's not a lot of energy left in the tank to engage in advocacy stuff. And it's really difficult because those higher, like not higher level, but broader things like policies are what really impact people's day-to-day -day life. But it takes so much coalition building and time and energy to make a change on those things. Um, and then you're kind of left during that Monday to Thursday beating your head against the same wall of each individual person running up against these structural problems. Um, and it's so like that experience is draining and then not having the funding to support the advocacy and having these bills come up is also draining and can feel kind of defeating at times. So those are some of at least the barriers that I've seen in terms of operating a harm reduction program and then trying to provide support to sex workers. I don't think that was the question though, no, but that was on my mind, so thanks. <laughs> I, think, I think it was relevant. Uh, I think it was relevant to incorporating an anti-racist pro-LGBT framework into harm reduction. Uh, I mean, everything you're saying is absolutely true, Katie. Um, as a trans woman of color who has lived experience as a drug user and sex worker, like, you know, like you're facing all these things every day and you can't even take the time to be angry or try to address them because you're too busy surviving. So I think that's really relevant. I do. I think harm reduction organizations already are doing this work of helping people survive. But it, when we are working with sex workers, we need to be more intentional. We need to be more supportive. Um, because obviously, you know, if harm reduction and sex work worked perfectly together, nobody would have started this conversation off as, well, these groups exist in silo. And that's what we're trying to do here. So I appreciate that a lot, Katie, actually. Um, does anyone else want to speak on like shadow banning or like OnlyFans? I did want to say something about the body positivity thing. Yes. You know, because I, I, I represent a lot of people and that means that I have to represent for people who are disabled, you know, and, and, and people that I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect transgender woman and I am perfectly happy with my body the way it is. And so are the clients that see me, you know, and, and I, I have to carry myself in a way that speaks to that. I'm a big girl. I'm tall, you know, and I'm, I'm fat now and I'm OK with it. And I still dress sexy when I get goddamn ready. And I don't care what people think because Y'all not putting no money in my pocket, but the men that I see sure are, you know, so be your authentic self and be unapologetic about it, baby. Because if I can walk around here in a sundress, 
with my big belly, looking like I'm nine months pregnant, and I ain't got no titties. My titties are shriveled up because I can't take hormones no more. I had a heart attack. It don't work with that. <laughs> I love me. And I teach others to love themselves. And I, te- I speak about how we should be accepted of everybody. We are a melting pot of rainbow love up in here. That's how I am when I am at my job. You know, that's what I represent for when I'm out here in these streets. You know, who am I to judge somebody else? I'm not perfect. And then the person that's judging me pretty much ain't perfect either. I love you so much, Mama. I really do. (laughs) Um, Well, the next question, we actually only have a few more questions. And I'm going to skip one of them, which is just what can harm reduction orgs do better to you know, better work their relationships with sex workers. I think we've talked so much about that. So my next question is chemsex. Drug use is a survival tool for sex workers to be able to work long hours and work as many clients as they can to increase their income stream. How have harm reduction organizations been successful or unsuccessful at working with people in the intersections of drug use and survival sex work? Oh my. So I started as a street-based sex worker and that's where I first met hips, you know, and I thought it was like so cool that they would come down and give us these condoms. And they had this little sheet they called the bad date sheet. So be on the lookout for this one because this one might be something to this sheet. And I thought that was so innovative in 1993, you know, and and it was life-saving. You know, they they would tell us to be careful to look out for certain things. And it made me feel a little bit better about being out there, you know. And then speaking on that drug use, yeah, I use drugs. I used to get high. I don't get high no more in that way. I still get high. I just get high off of different shit today, you know. And, and, and it helped me to stay alert, to keep high on what I was doing. And I'm, I'm kind of... I get sleepy early, so I needed something to make me stay awake. I needed to meet a quota. I had self-set quotas. You know, I knew what I was going to use for my drugs that night. I knew what I needed to carry home with me, you know, and then I knew what my time limit was, and I had a certain time that I had to work into. And those were some of the tools that I used, and because of that early relationship I had with HIPS, I think it helped me to mitigate a lot of harm that could have came upon me. You know, I'm not saying that it stopped all of it. They couldn't stop what the police would do to me. But it helped me to avoid a lot of shit for years that those years that I was on the street. One thing that's been helpful for us in terms of doing similar services to what Tamika is describing, providing services on the stroll or at night is being fast and efficient and like having people on the team who know what they're doing because um, if you're trying to get a date that night, your date might have three choices, but he might be the only one looking for a date in that moment. So if somebody is taking the time to leave the window of that date's car and come to the van, like we have to prioritize them in that moment and make sure they get what they need and not hold them up with any unnecessary stuff. So sometimes that means like cutting some of the administrative small talk stuff like that, just like, here's what you need, get going, have a great night. Similar things like Tamika's describing tools like bad dates reports can be really helpful too. Um, But that's something that I've seen like help our team be successful in meeting people is just like having everybody be well-trained. So that way when people come get services, they get what they need and they get going. And if they want to stay and talk, that's great. But if they've got a date, like, bye, won't hold you up, keep going, make money. Wait, Katie. So you're saying that as a harm reductionist, you choose to not get all the data, everything that you might want to get, but you choose to help the person meet them where they're at and get them what they need versus what you want and need. What an interesting concept, y'all. Yeah. (laughs) I wish that was more common. 
I wish um, syringe service program participant IDs didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm thinking about. You know, like I um I, I won't say who, but I had to face a barrier to get condoms and Narcan. And it's like, I'm not gonna sit through your 10 minute training on how to properly put, yeah, you know, so that is really awesome. And especially with chem sex, people engaging in chem sex, it's quick, it's in and out. You know what I mean? You gotta be asking the questions quick or you're not gonna get the info you want. I wanna make space for Janae and Soma before we get to the last question. It's kind of cute, the last question, so. Well, I was just about to um, write in the chat, but I, I so agree and I say this a lot. I'm sorry, let me turn my camera on, I'm sorry. Um, I say this a lot, um, that some of the things that we think we're doing are also creating barriers. Right, like you said, no one is going to sit through a, a demonstration on safe injection, have to set up a site, you know, set up an ID and all those things in order to get the harm reduction tools that they need. Because if I'm coming down off my high and I want to get up, I don't have time for that. Like we're doing such a disservice to folks uh, when we start thinking about all of the things that we must collect in order to like provide services to folks. But then also it's like, I feel like that's also another form of policing. Like you wanna take all of their demographics down um, and, and, and like get into the weeds of them before you can actually service them, like in, which is gonna push them away instead of, you know, building a rapport with them where now, maybe like that first time or the second time, like, all right, baby, you know, you, they get comfortable with you. Now they're able to come back in and have a, like, a, more of a dialogue with you, right? Now they'll come and they'll sit in your drop-in center or they'll come and they'll, you know, maybe talk with you. You can start collecting that data more freely as time go on instead of saying, like, well, in order for you to, because then what that does is instead of them waiting to, train get the training from you they're going to go find that needle on the street right they're going to go um uh reuse like or whatever the case may be and the only thing they're doing is we're actually heightening the thing that we were set out to um to damn play right and, and to and to get under control so um i think we do a disservice by doing that I think there are more ways to kind of get that information across with and collect it in more of a freelance way than having them sit down, do this whole training and whole nine yards, right? And then what if I'm the fourth person in line? So then I got to wait for you to do the training with them, then me do another training, right? And you set up all these accounts in order for me to get it. I'm not sitting there waiting. That's going to be 40 minutes. That's going to be 30, I'm, 40 minutes. And, and, and the guy going to be going so I can't go cop. Right, and my friends is gonna leave me. And then I'm gonna be sitting here not in in no bread. So why am I sitting here waiting? You know, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. I wanna echo that really quick as someone who used to work in direct service and had to come up with creative ways to engage meth users, it is not realistic to get all the data that you want. It is not realistic to get every single identifier. Um, and also it is alienating and it alienates people. Um, I wanna go ahead and ask the last question. It should only take three minutes and then we can get into Q and A if that's all right with everyone on the panel. Cool. Across America, policing budgets are being increased. Historically, over-policing has harmed sex workers. If you could use the money being funneled into policing for anything, what would you use it for instead? Who would like to be our first contestant? Job training, housing, which is the backbone to anything sustainable, right? And any sustainable living, like not just housing, adequate housing um, that is not discriminatory, right? Um, I think those job trainings and, and, and workforce development, those things are some like more some of the most key components to, you know, um, ushering folks to 
being more sustainable, right? Mental health treatment, um, like those things, right? I don't think we really need to keep uh, increasing policing budgets. I think we need to actually um, decrease some of those budgets and start putting more of those into social services because if we start addressing the social services needs, you may actually start seeing that some of the crime and, you know, if you start addressing the poverty issues, some of those things will start going down because now it's not, I have to hustle, bustle, and stretch, you know, to, to make ends meet. I can just go on and live and be comfortable um, if you actually give me the resources that we need. Go on. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to echo that. One of the things that Janae said that I think is really important is not just housing, but adequate housing. And I think that that applies to all services. And, you know, like what we'll see here, I'm not, I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the country, but we see people cycle through programs and you know, they're really treated very poorly in some of these housing programs. People um, are get, get searched and then they have their legal paraphernalia taken away from them. And, you know, like, and, and that's just sort of like the start of it, you know, like what we really need when we talk about housing is harm reduction housing and harm reduction housing that also has um, a space for safe consumption, you know, because, we, we are losing people to overdose or back to the street because what we have just doesn't work. Um, so, you know, and, and then I think this is all tied in with decriminalization, the larger talk around decriminalizations because we shouldn't even have police period policing our people for these behaviors. It's insane. So we have to decriminalize sex work. We have to decriminalize drug use. I could talk about this for hours, but I'm going to try and summarize, summarize this. Living wage employment, oh, excuse me, thriving wage employment. This is what we need, number one. And then we need to decarcerate the system across the board. We need to re-envision what the criminal justice system is supposed to look like. You know, they're, 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 putting people in jail for things that can be rehabilitated. Jail does not rehabilitate a soul. They punish you. It's nothing but punishment. Housing should not be an issue in this country. There are enough vacant homes in this country for everybody to have a fucking place to stay. It's absolutely ridiculous. Housing costs are ridiculous. Where, what kind of country are we living in that we are not pulling up people from the bottom end to where we are. We're too comfortable with letting people be poor here. There should not be a poverty line in this country. We are the richest country in the world. And we need to be staying on our legislators' ass about being fair with what our tax dollars are supposed to be spent on. And I don't want it spent on police. We need harm reduction centers, 24-hour uh, uh, harm reduction centers. We need crisis intervention teams. We need safe consumption sites. We need to end homelessness. We have enough stock of empty houses to end homelessness today in every city in this country. But it does not work unless we factor in the mental health of things. We need absolute resources put back into the people. We need an investment in people instead of trying to figure out how we can continue to punish people. An investment in the people means health care, housing, food security, and job security. We need to break barriers down. There should not be a barrier to getting a job. If I want to work, I should be able to have a damn job and not be worried about passing the drug screening or having enough good credit to get a job. That's stupid. If I have bad credit, don't you think I need a job? I mean, come on, where's common sense in these things that we're letting these people up on Capitol Hill get away with? It's our tax dollars. It's time for us to start pushing back and push hard.
Thank you, Tamika. I'm going to give Katie these like two minutes, if that's okay, and then we're going to breeze through Q&A. So much of it has already been said when you first asked the question, I just wanted to scream the word housing as loud as I could. Um, and by housing, I mean what everybody has described, like housing where you can use drugs, normal housing, housing where you can live, live with people that you love, have a pet, like live a normal, comfortable life. What we've described as housing for people in this current state is housing where you have curfews and you get searched and you can only have two bags and you can only stay for 90 days and you're treated like a criminal just because you don't have a place to live and you don't have a place to live because insert a lot of words about this country that are just so many and um beyond that all of the other programs folks have described like having a social safety net we don't have one the closest thing that we have to what people describe as like welfare is $184 TDAP and that's only if you can find like a medical provider to sign off on it and you need to fill out a social security application which takes like a PhD um, to complete a social security application and the chances that that's even going to get like fulfilled is close to zero. Um, I've had people who are getting social security who like the government misidentified them as dead and then they like stopped receiving benefits and were no longer eligible like the systems are like rusty tires <laughs> like just rolling somewhere I don't even know they're so so broken and beyond that like there's the impact that it has on all the folks that don't have access to safety and stability but then all the folks who are like slightly more comfortable and trying to like pull people with them are just getting burnt out and a big piece of that is that we don't have systems that we can navigate like the role of somebody like a case manager or a peer support person is to help walk them through the systems, but the systems don't exist. Like there are systems, but they're not accessible. They don't have the services that people actually need. So like, can we even call it a system or it's just like something that we're posing as like, oh, this is the solution. You can go to a shelter. Not if you like insert 12 page document here. Um, so that's my shortest answer, um, but the loudest one is housing. I mean, also, I don't know about anybody else, but the DC shelters are filled with bedbugs. So huh, I don't know a single person that would stay at a shelter. I did it. <laughs> um, now we're on to our Q&A portion. Some of the questions have already been answered. Um, there's five open still. Um, so I'm not really sure how to answer these. Mark, you can help me do the answer answer part. But the first question is, what is something that y'all would like those not involved in sex work to know about sex work? Sex workers come from a variety of walks of life. I'm a parent. <laughs> you know, I have grandkids and great grandbabies and my family knows what I do. I don't hide who I am to them. You know, so it's not like I have to live a secret life. You know, and I am still loved and admired and nobody keeps their kids from me. I'm the, ba I'm the favored babysitter in my family. I'm just a normal person that lives next door to a lot of you people that you just didn't know what I was doing. I would say that um, it, it's interesting because from my perspective, because I, I don't have that same experience, um, I, I want to talk about the opposite experience for sex workers where they are pushed out of um, communities and families and sometimes their families completely stop talking to people that's you know some of my experience with my family and something that I've seen for a lot of street-based sex workers as well where there's absolutely no support system because of the stigma of being a sex worker so people are then just completely cut off and that affects everything that affects having a ride to go for health care it affects holidays and loneliness and just you know a very deep separation from other people and you know it's it's interesting because y'all chose to talk about today as international sex workers day for me it is international whores day and I think it's so important to reclaim the word whore and understand the damage that we experience socially as a result of some of these words. I mean, what's like one of the, the worst things that you can say to someone, you know, like your mom's a whore 
or something like that. I'm, I'm a mom and I am a whore. And so today is my day and my people's day. And, and so I think it's really important to really understand the depths of stigma for sex workers. I am just typing those up right now, but as I'm typing up, um, I just want to make sure I get this right. It's important, the um, stigma surrounding sex workers to note the stigma surrounding sex workers. That's what you were saying. Okay, cool. I want to make sure I didn't quote you wrong. Um, Joseph Dixon asks, I understand SESTA FOSTA criminalizes websites that promote or advertise sex work. I am unclear whether it also decriminalizes advocacy and educational sites as well. To my knowledge, it depends on what it is, but I, I don't want to give the answer if someone else has a better answer. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it, I don't. I, I don't think so. It, it's just kind of hard of a sell for them to, to, to be able to criminalize them because it is it's basically criminalizing a third party for allowing someone to post about sexual things, like anything in nature that could constitute soliciting. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not interpreting what that law was for, I don't think it affected like what HIPS promotes on its website or any of our other social service agencies that we are connected to. Okay, yeah, I, sorry, I thought that was a better question than what I had initially read. Um, I just uh, deleted it, but just so people know, um, educational resources and materials are fine. There are certain limitations, like for example, if you do a live naloxone, um, a live naloxone demonstration on TikTok um, or Instagram, it will be taken down. I'm a little wily though, and I get it on Instagram anyway. Um, the next question is, what bridges can be built between coalitions of sex workers and coalitions of, oh, no, never mind. I want to delete that question. No, we're not doing that question. Sorry. Um, what was the question you sent me, Mark? Sorry. <laughs> um, it was um, the question. Oh, it was that how, one. Okay. Question, All right. Question, um, we'll, we'll hit this. I, I thought this was awkward. People who resist vaccine mandates and coalitions of sex workers, how can they come together? Um, the, what they say is, as troubling as it is, I'm having a hard time not drawing parallels between the way that MasterCard has cut people off from their resources and GoFundMe and other banks diverting willfully donated resources away from Canadian truckers, not to mention Roe v. Wade being overturned. These are all questions of bodily autonomy and imposed dominion over the individual by hired, appointed, and elect, uh, elected bureaucracy. So yeah, do you guys think that there is space for coalition building between sex workers and people that are hesitant to being vaccinated? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I suppose that there could be some people that would be interested in that. I personally am not. You know, I am, I am vaccinated myself. I was hesitant in the beginning after I saw that other people survive taking it and they didn't turn into zombies. I took the vaccine. I've been fine ever since. I have not had the boosters yet because I don't go anywhere. I'm in the house 99.9% .9 of the time. I'm kind of scared of going outside because of COVID. And I guess that y'all you, you know that I'm not doing any sex work right now. I'm completely dependent on my job for my survival. You know, yeah. but I, I, I guess that there might be somebody that would be interested in it. I mean, because it is a bodily autonomy issue. And But then on, 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 on the flip side of that, it is also a community health issue. You know, and I know a lot of sex workers that were put at risk out here because of COVID-19 and having no choice but to go out here in the streets and to work under those conditions and be fearful of their lives. And a lot of the sex workers I'm referring to did have the vaccine. 
Some opted not to. Those some that I know that opted not to ended up with COVID. A lot of them have survived, but then they have these long COVID symptoms. So, I mean, there's that. But then when we're talking about how this thing with the GoFundMe, or GoFundMe is an a, a, a entity that, that has rules and they're arbitrary as hell. They have blocked me on my fundraising, but I raised enough hell against them to where they gave it back. I don't know. I didn't know anything about them taking away the resources for the Canadian truckers. I hadn't heard about that. But then again, on this web, Roe versus Wade, stay out of people's business. You know, that is not a place for this law to be even brought back up. It has been long decided. Now, if they want to take on some legislation, go ahead and do something about this war on fucking drugs. I'd rather you tackle that and reverse that than to be messing with this bodily autonomy issue because drug use is a bodily autonomy issue. You know? Well, sorry, my- Tamika, sorry to cut you off. It's just we are at time. So I want to give um, the opportunity to everyone to just say one last piece if they want in this last minute they got. Um, if not, I just want to thank all the panelists and then I'll hand it off to Mark as soon as everyone says, you know, their goodbye. Thank you. I'm just going to say sex work is work and leave my body alone. Yeah, I would almost guarantee that I actually would guarantee that you know somebody who's a sex worker. So just because you think you don't just doesn't mean that you don't. It means that the person in your life or people in your life who are engaged in sex work don't trust you with that information and that's okay too. Um, But the best thing that you can do is treat everybody with dignity and respect and that includes sex workers. Any other final closing words from Soma, Tamika? If not, we can bow out. I just wanna say thank you for hosting this conversation and it's really great to hear all of these different voices you know, sex workers are not a monolith. And I feel like it's such a good representation of a broad spectrum of sex workers that you had here today. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, I think I'm just going to end it with with appreciation for all of y'all. Thank you for all the attendees. And thank you for this wonderful panel. All of you were just beautiful. I love you guys. Yes, yes, yes. On that note, um, it has been a really, really great conversation, really fruitful um, and really excited and honored, as always, to be in community with each of the panelists, um, as well as Jessica and Annie. Um, Annie, if you don't mind just putting up the quick slide of the contact information, Um, I wanted to make sure that folks that are interested, we weren't able to answer all of the questions just because of time's sake, but I really urge you all to connect Um, with our panelists. And if you have any questions about sort of harm reduction, um, the scope of work that each uh, panelist is doing within their respective organization. I mean, we have Soma, uh, whose org is based out in LA, Janae, who's based out in Baltimore, as well as Katie, and um, Tamika, who's also based out in DC. Um, This is their contact information, um, as well as um, both myself and Jessica. I'm listed here if you have any more questions about sort of policy work or harm reduction work uh, related to sex workers. Um, But uh, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. um, And we also will be sending out an evaluation form uh, to discuss uh, in further detail. I mean, we will be sending out a evaluation form for you all to answer anonymously um, just to provide feedback on today's webinar. Other than that, I hope everyone has a lovely Thursday afternoon. Thank y'all each for being here and dropping knowledge on everybody. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Take care of yourselves.